Hi, and welcome to the third lesson uh, in this Humanities class online. So what we'll be doing uh, in this lesson is we'll be reviewing uh, the next historical age um, along with the next uh, text that we'll be reading. Uh, and this time, the lesson, as you can see, is entitled Revolution and Romanticism. So let's just get started. So we start with the first part, which is going to be the age of revolution. Here you see um, a scene from the American Revolution, George Washington on a boat sailing. Um, so the age of revolution, it's basically starts in the late 18th century, and we see at that time two major revolutions, one at least you should be very familiar with, and that's the American Revolution, which is approximately 1775, or you could say 1776, to 1783. And the second is the French Revolution from approximately 1789 to 17, 1799. So both revolutions are fundamentally going to be spurred on by the events that transpired during the Enlightenment, including the changes to the social and political ideals, uh, literary and philosophical developments um, relating to the dignity of the human being, notions of the independence and autonomy of reason, and of course notions of freedom and inequality which begin to break down class distinctions and these ideas are going to be further fueled by developments uh, that precede that time within science, the scientific revolution, the agricultural and the industrial revolutions which we've talked about uh, thus far. So let's begin and we'll talk first about the American Revolution. Here we have a depiction of the signing of the Declaration of Independence by John Trumbull. It's an oil on canvas which, is, which was painted in 1819. You'll notice actually that that painting is on the back of the two dollar bill if you ever have the opportunity to see or if you have one of these bills just take a look. So the American Revolution, um, the primary cause, we're just going to kind of look at the American Revolution the history here in real summary. Well, the primary cause we see is, of course, it's going to be economic. That's not going to be the only cause, but it's one of the primary causes, and it's going to be economic as a result of Great Britain's accumulation of war debts. So what's going to happen is Great Britain is going to be attempting to fund a number of wars which it has on multiple, in multiple continents, and in doing so, Great Britain will impose taxes on its colonies, which were the American colonies, and these taxes, they include increased taxes on sugar, examples of sugar, stamps, and of course tea, everyone's familiar kind of with the Boston Tea Party protests. Uh, uh, the Americans eventually will reject these taxes, and the basis of these rejections uh, will, they will say, well basically, look, this, this type of taxation is uh, politically incorrect, not correct, rather. Uh, they call it unconstitution. Why? Because you're taxing us and we have no representation. We have no ability to say uh, whether or not we should receive these taxes and how much these taxes should be. And the reason is that the colonies, uh, the colonies at the time, the American colonies, had no representation within the British uh, the British Parliament at the time, and so we have the phrase, no taxation without representation. So just for a short uh, timeline here, we see that the American Revolution begins approximately April 1775 with the Boston, Massachusetts protests, and this leads to conflict and death with British troops, which will eventually result in war. Uh, July 4th, 1776, Independence Day, a day uh, this is a date that you should all know. We have the signing of the Declaration of Independence, uh, where we're going to see that the early revolutionaries declare government by consent of the governed. They declare the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, 
And uh, in reading, for example, the Bill of Rights, you'll see that these fundamental values are values that are going to be espoused by the French Revolution as well, and they will be values that develop earlier on within the Enlightenment. So they're basically Enlightenment values. Um, and then we have here, oh, the five there, just remove that. The June 21st, 1788, we see that the U.S. Constitution is ratified or brought into effect, and the Constitution espouses three branches of government, the legislative, the judiciary, and the executive. And of course, we saw that this balance of power derived its origin from such thinkers as John Locke and Montesquieu, of course, Enlightenment thinkers as well. December 15, 1791, the Bill of Rights is added in which okay, equal rights is granted uh, to all men, uh, excepting, in this case, slaves and women, uh, slaves having no rights or very few rights, and women uh, still lacking the capacity to vote. Okay? So let's turn then uh, to the French Revolution. The French Revolution is actually going to be a little more significant for this uh, course, uh, just on account of the fact that, that a lot of the texts that we'll be dealing with will find their heritage within the European tradition. So here we have uh, an example of the French Revolution uh, romantic style painting, which we're going to look at uh, throughout this lesson in part two or, or three of the lesson. And this is an example of Delacroix, his liberty leading the people, a very famous painting which you see liberty, the symbol of liberty, holding the French flag, the French rep, the flag of the revolution, in fact, okay, and you see the three colors there, of red, white, and blue. Uh, those colors are, in fact, very symbolic, the uh, red symbolizing brotherhood, the white symbolizing uh, equality, and the blue symbolizing freedom. And you see that liberty there stands upon dead bodies. You see that her, her shirt is pulled down, symbolized, and this symbolizes, of course, both freedom, but also the travesties and horrors of war. All right, so let's look at some of the historical events. Again, we're going to do this um, in summary form. You also have a video to watch on the French Revolution. Uh, make sure that all of you watch that video. It's actually a very interesting documentary um, about the basic values that fueled the French Revolution, um, how the revolution uh, w went and, under, and the various changes that occurred during the revolution, where it basically fell into a very desperate time uh, in which uh, a number of horrors okay, occurred during the revolution. It's a very uh, interesting documentary to see, both to see how, for example, a, a country under oppression can move to democracy, but also the type of oppression that can occur, even when democratic ideals okay, become the norm. Okay. So we have the French Revolution is a pivotal event in Western hist European history, and it basically is going to unfold within France from the old regime. 1774, we have Louis XVI taking the throne during a period of deep unrest and inequality, an increasing middle class, as, as we've seen, due to industrialization, or the Industrial Revolution. And in 1789, we see that Louis convenes the Estates General, which hadn't met since the 1600s. Um, that's going to be his major mistake and downfall, because as he convenes the Estates General to talk about general economic problems that are occurring, the middle class, which was really kind of not given a say during the meeting, decides to form a separate national constituent assembly. And effectively, that begins the French Revolution. They rejected the nobles and church leaders, and they proceed to end aristocratic rule. So there's a number of phases of the French Revolution, which again, I'll go over quickly, because you'll be watching that video. And the first phase is from 1789 to 1792, uh, this is going to be dominated by the upper middle class. And within that phase, they'll be introducing a form of representative democratic government of sorts. They approve the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which you'll be reading. And unfortunately, this initial phase ultimately fails, and Louis XVI still holds a grip and power over, 
over France. The second phase, 92 to 95, is now going to be dominated by the lower bourgeois, the industrialists, as well as the working class, the proletariat, which Marx will later call. And it's going to be uh, a period marked by violence and radical change, uh, which you'll see in the video, especially as we lead up into the reign of terror. So they're going to execute the king. Um, they're going to try to replace Christianity with various, uh, let's say, uh, religious views based on rational principles. But what they will do on a positive level is begin to introduce and implement the various Enlightenment views, uh, at, which is which was stated in this Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, including granting uh, full rights to all males, blacks, and Jews. Uh, of course, this excludes women. Um, and we'll talk about this later on in the course, and in, in another lesson we'll talk about the rights of women as well. Uh, however, education is going to be opened up to women, and also equal treatment. So this is going to then lead within the second phase, 93 to 94, to the reign of terror led by Maximilien Robespierre. And you'll be seeing a lot of this in that video, so make sure you watch that. It's, it's a very unfortunate phase, um, which you can see kind of a, an equivalent almost in the uh, move uh, within the late uh, National Socialism move in the, in the late, later part of the Second World War where the, the Nazis were led into these very harsh practices um, in which they had, for example, the final solution, which was ultimately the execution of uh, the Jews within Europe uh, through the use of gas chambers. So we see something similar in the French Revolution, um, especially we're going to see multiple executions, almost 800 a day at one point, you'll see in the video, of suspected enemies of the revolution. Okay, kind of a witch hunt occurs during that time. So the third phase uh, and the end within the third phase, about 95 to 99, the directory established, which is a kind of moderate republic of shared power, two legislative houses, five directors. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be a very weak stage within the revolution, which is going to be marked by further counter-revolution, economic hardship, which really drives it to its end. And on account of that, they make the mistake, as it were, of appealing for military aid, um, and they ask the general at the time, who was up north fighting their wars with neighboring countries, Napoleon Bonaparte, to help them establish the directory and to, to give it a foundation. And instead, Napoleon comes in, he says, sure, I'll help out. But what he does instead is he effects a coup d'etat, which is a stroke of state, and he overthrows the directory. It's a violent stroke of state, in fact. And he establishes a, co a, a consulate, ba basically making himself the dictator. Um, one of the things, however, which is going to be positive about Napoleon's rule is he's going to establish a bit of normalcy within France um, and strengthen France during the time so it's going to proceed to conquer other European states. He establishes the French Empire, he establishes the Napoleonic Code, which basically institutes the reforms, which are the, the kind of positive reforms that are initiated within the French Revolution, which will lead to later French um, democracy. Um, Napoleon will eventually, his conquest of Europe will eventually be end in Russia in 1812 as... Uh, Hitler and the Nazis' conquest will end around 1945 in the Second World War, mostly due to the severe conditions of winter. All right. So let's move okay, out of this historical aspect into now a discussion of Romantic art. So <clears throat> here we have an example of Romantic art of Turner, the Bell Rock Lighthouse. What you want to look at here is this emphasis on kind of nature and sort of the turbulence of the passions expressed in art as natural phenomena express kind of that turbulence as well. So what is Romanticism? It's basically an intellectual, it's an artistic, it's a literary movement that initiates around and with the French Revolution. It's not limited to France only, okay? Uh, and on, on account of that, you're going to see that the Romantic artists are going to revolt against these early aristocratic values, 
uh, the early emphasis upon science and rationalism, so Romanticism will emphasize the irrational within the human being, for example, desire, lust, love, passion, strife, um, the irrational in nature. And so you're going to see within Romantic art and literature an emphasis upon nature and the turbulence of nature. You'll see pictures of shipwrecks, storms, violence, of nightmares, etc. All right, so what we're going to do is take a look at some Romantic art and then we're going to turn to and discuss the Romantic art and then we're going to turn to an initial discussion of uh, Goethe, uh, whose Sorrows of Young Werther will be, in fact, an ex a, a great example of Romantic literature, and that book, of course, you'll be reading. So here we have Jean-Louis Guéricault, The Raft of the Medusa. So what you want to notice here, again, is this emphasis upon nature. But another thing to notice here, and this is going to be important because we'll be looking at works of art in its development into modernity. Notice how, and you can kind of compare this to the neoclassicist paintings, that now the picture itself, well, the colors and the images, okay, although we still have a depiction which kind of represents kind of objective reality, how people actually look, there's this emphasis upon the inner expression of the artist so that the colors don't necessarily represent what you're actually seeing. There's a kind of over-dramatization of color and form. This movement here, which is initiated within Romanticism, is going to then be very influential upon later art, such as Impressionism, which will influence that movement into Abstractionism, and thus modern and postmodern art, that kind of art that we're kind of familiar with today. For example, looking at a picture, and you're not really seeing anything like an actual form, something that you'd know, but you're seeing something like shapes and lines and colors. Well, here we see that initial progression into that. Here we have another example, a, 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 a natural scene here, Claude Joseph Vernet, The Shipwreck. Um, this is going to be, a Dutch painter here, is going to be characteristic of the Sturm und Drang movement. This is basically Romanticism in Germany. Sturm und Drang refers to the storm and stress. Okay, it's just kind of a Romanticism among the Germanic-speaking people, such as the Dutch and the Germans. And of course, Goethe will be representative of that in literature. So you see, again, that emphasis upon kind of a drama, the passions, kind of bringing out your emotion and trying to appeal to the emotions as you see this work of art. And here we have Francisco de Goya, The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. So again, romant what Romanticism wants to emphasize is the fact that the human being, although we have this kind of, we have reason, we can make our own choices, what Romanticism wants to suggest is that our choices are going to be influenced by the irrational, right? So this will be interesting when we start to, when we look later on at psychology and psychotherapy. We'll look at surrealism as well and Freud and of course Viktor Frankl whose book we'll be reading because we'll see within this later movement the unconsciousness will be emphasized as influencing okay, our choices and here we see this within Romanticism, this early kind of awareness of the unconsciousness Though, for Romanticism, it's kind of looked at as a kind of influence of just desire and the passions and the irrational, all right? Another painting here, Francisco, de Goya, uh, Francisco Goya, The Execution of the 3rd of May, 1808. So notice here also the scene, notice how the picture here, it's almost kind of like cartoonish. So it's very important because you see these painters starting to move away from depicting kind of objects as they really look and expressing the objects. This will be very important for later Impressionism and post-Impressionism and modern abstract art here. Notice also how the scene, okay, as opposed to something like neoclassical art, you're not looking at something which is a noble kind of depiction of the human dignity, the freedom and the autonomy of reason. You're looking at something which is terrible here, which is execution. You see men dead on the floor, you see the man here about to be killed, and there's something sort of, there's an indignity in his expression that something's being destroyed here, right? So the passions are overtaking us, 
and the human being in war and the turmoil of war is kind of something to look at as an, something negative within the human experience. And here we have Caspar David Friedrich, the wanderer above a sea of mist in German. Um, this is actually the picture you'll see at the beginning of each of the lectures. Um, and notice how it's kind of an image of a, a man standing on a rock over a mountain, kind of contemplating nature. So this is important, especially when, when you read Goethe. What you want to think of is how nature can be, and also our passions, can be both soothing, right, and turbulent. And notice how, how the romantic painting will suggest this. Here we have kind of a soothing, peaceful moment. And in fact, we have that. We have the the feelings of joy and inner peace and solitude um, and rest, right? But then these can be eclipsed by feelings of sadness, hate, right? Um, the passions of desire and lust, greed and envy, right? And all these passions can influence um, how we act. And when we talk about Werther, the book we'll be reading by Goethe, we'll see that Werther is going to be deeply influenced by these conflicting passions and these expressions will ultimately lead to kind of his final choice um, in his kind of pursuit of this passion that he has for this woman. Um, here we have Joseph Mallard William Turner, the slave ship. Um, here, again, what you want to see is that de-emphasis upon painting actual images, real-to-life images, which we saw in neoclassicism. Here it's a beautiful painting, which if you actually saw it in a museum, for example, you'd see just the, the sun there and the, the colors glittering off the page. Um, and see, here we have a very unfortunate scene of a slave ship um, and the slavers throwing overboard the dead and the dying. Um, and unfortunately, some of the slaves that were thrown overboard in order to make the, the ship lighter during the storm, they still have their chains on, so they're bound to their chains these horrible slavers who are trying to save themselves throw these men overboard still with their chains on giving them absolutely no hope within that sea so it's a terrible depiction at the same time you see there's a kind of tranquility within the sun that's kind of either setting or rising a very strange image okay so let's turn now to uh, part three romantic literature um, and here we have a picture of there there it's actually a poster, an early poster, 1893, by Jules Massenet. And so Werther's kind of contemplating, you know, his love and the desires that are wreaking havoc in his soul. When you really, when we look at this text, okay, which I'll be just summarizing here, and you'll, you'll read it and make sure that you read through the entire text and take your time to read it and think about the different parts in the scene, the plot that unfolds in the text. It's really kind of a, a, a romance novel, it's romantic literature, but it's kind of romance novel and tragedy on par with something like Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet or something like, you've seen the movie, the Titanic, right? Something very tragic romance, okay? So first of all, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, 1749 to 1832. He's probably the most important and famous German poet uh, and writer, he was also a novel, a scientist and a statesman, he's a playwright. Um, he's really on par, if you think about something like someone like William Shakespeare, well, for Shakespeare is to the English literature as Goethe is to German literature. And, uh, of course, the significance of Goethe has gone beyond just German literature. He's one of the greatest uh, literary figures of the modern era, not just German literary figures, is one of the greatest literary figures. And he's going to be particularly representative of the Romantic movement. In many ways, the Romantic movement in German literature begins with Goethe. Okay? So his famous work, which we're not reading, it's a very long work, it's a great work, is Faust. Um, and it's really Europe's greatest long poem since Milton's Paradise Lost and Dante's Divine Comedy. So Faust is about an old man who's a kind of alchemist and philosopher. And this old man has spent his entire life studying and trying to gain knowledge, only to find out in old age that, well, 
all this knowledge that I gained is for nothing. I'm just going to die. And so he prays to the devil, and he prays to have his, for the devil to come and give him his youth back. And lo and behold, the devil comes in the form of Mephistopheles and grants him his wish, and he becomes a young man again, and he falls in love with a woman, a young lady. Um, but eventually, of course, he made a deal with the devil, and he has to reckon to that day. So if you ever get a chance, it's a great... Um, long poem, or it's really kind of a, just a work of literature that you should read at some point. So, The Sorrows of Young Werther was written a bit earlier when Goethe was a young man, and in a way it kind of is an account of Goethe's own travails as a young man. As I said, it's a tragic romance novel, and here's the interesting thing. It was written in four weeks. Now think about four weeks ago what you were doing. Right? So it's basically a month ago. Now imagine having written an entire novel in that time. In fact, Goethe wrote the novel and there was, and there was very little editing for it. So many uh, scholars think that, well, it's kind of a, a fictional account of Goethe's own life. Now what's going to happen is that the novel is going to, when it's, when it's published eventually, it's going to lead to what's called Werther Fieber, which was a kind of fever among the people. Think about the Beatles when they first came into America, if you've ever seen pictures of that. Or, I don't know, some of the singers today, how the kids, they go crazy when these singers, uh, you know, debut. Um, well, basically, Goethe's novel became such a hit, it was, in fact, the first novel to find international press outside of Germany, and in fact it was translated into multiple languages. However, the problem with the novel is that it's a tragic romance. So like Romeo and Juliet, for example, it leads to the suicide, and I'm kind of giving it away, but that's, that's the way it ends, the suicide of Werther. Um, the problem is that the effect of the novel was so strong on the young of the time that some people began to emulate Werther in the novel and began to commit suicide. Um, and this kind of reaction for Goethe was, Goethe was very upsetting. In the first place, it led to his immediate fame, um, and he was kind of a, a solitary individual, and he really didn't like being famous at such a young age and at such a, a large level. And also, the rest of his life is kind of, he never was able to shake off, okay, that first bestseller, even though Faust was a much greater work, okay, it's a very different work, okay. Um, it never received that type of attention at the time that the Sorrows of Werther did. One could say that, historically speaking, Faust has been a much more influential novel. But Werther is kind of that great tragic romance. Um, it was also a shock to Goethe in terms of that emulation, that suicide emulation, which was the Liebestod, it was called. Um, and as a result of that, what Goethe actually did is he took the original edition and he edited it, and he kind of watered it down so that now the edition that we have is, does not really have the same kind of shock appeal that the original edition had. Unfortunately, I tried to find the original edition uh, for the book because, of course, now we're, we're sort of 200 years or so um, away apart from the novel. So we have a distance from it. We could read it without really getting so embroiled in, in the actual scenes as, as the individuals of that age did. It's kind of a difference in age uh, in, in, in that we would kind of, we wouldn't feel as close to it, but I couldn't find the original. So we have the second edition in which he includes an interlude and he includes also a few passages within, throughout the no novel to kind of water down the effect so that you, you obtained a bit of a distance from, the, from Werther and you don't get too sucked in to the novel. But still, the novel does suck you in and you kind of follow this kind of travail of Werther and you see how it's, he kind of breaks down emotionally in his love for Charlotte. This young lady. Now, the book itself, uh, as I write here, single-handedly breaks 
with classicism and leads to romanticism in Germany, the Sturm und Drang movement, the storm and stress movement, which is German romanticism. So what we're going to do um, is we're, I'm going to give you a, a kind of summary of the novel, okay? And what you're going to do is use that summary and use the kind of methods that I have to piece together the text on your own. I'm going to give you kind of the main points which will direct you in the right direction. And also when you do the reading questions, you'll, those reading questions will also direct you toward the, the significant aspects of the text. Um, now let's look at what an analysis is. So we kind of talked about that in the beginning and also what an interpretation is in our first lesson about the methods of humanities. So analysis. Take a book like Werther and what you want to do is first break down the actual text itself into its main parts. So what you'll see when you open the text is that there's actually an introductory part and it's a note by Werther, by Goethe himself, which he leaves in the text. Um, after that, you see that the text is composed of two parts, and there's also an interlude in the last part. So you can start there. You have that beginning note, you have the part one of the text, and you have the part, second part of the text. Now, each, now the text itself is broken down into dates, and these are the letters that Werther sends to his friend. What we're actually reading Okay, fictional, of course, are apparently letters which Goethe says he found, and he's put it in order for us. And so each of the the letters itself, okay, states something about what's happening in the life of Werther to his friend. So now you can start to set to analyze and say, well, okay, we have two parts. We have the beginning note, we have the interlude as well, and we have each part is composed of different letters. And you can then see, well, what's happening? And maybe you can start to analyze, well, what's happening in Werther's life during this, these dates and during the next dates, etc. And then you start to break that down and say, okay, this is where the, this is the structure of the novel with the parts and we have the dates where certain things are happening in his life. You see, that's an analysis. Notice how we take a complex novel and we break it down into simple parts. So we analyze each part and we attempt to identify the literal meaning of the text. So this is analysis. So when you analyze something, you don't want to interpret. In other words, you want to just say, okay, what's happening in the text? So in the beginning, you could say that, well, that Werther writes that he's in this new, Val in, in Valheim, in this new place, and he's feeling very happy, and he talks about some events, some kind of love affair that he had preceding, okay, uh, this time, a love affair which we don't know of, but he talks about it, which we haven't seen rather, but he talks about it. Now, you don't want to try to dig in and find the meaning of that. Now, there is a meaning there, which will be important for the later novel, but when you're analyzing, you just want to identify the fact that, well, he's saying, okay, I've had this love affair. You can kind of note that. Well, he states that he's had this love affair before. See, that's analysis. Don't interpret just kind of describe, see description, okay, the parts and what's actually happening, what's literally being said, okay? Interpretation is where you try to discern the deeper literary meaning, okay? So in terms of the scene that I described, what we see is that, well, Werther is mentioning that he had a love affair before and it led to a mental breakdown and that's why, why he's in Valheim on this retreat. So what it points to, here's the meaning, is that Werther is already a bit unstable. Notice how I'm interpreting, right? I'm pulling out my own ideas here. That's interpretation. It means he's a bit unstable, mentally unstable, and so this is going to affect the events that thereafter happen. For example, his meeting with Charlotte, where he immediately becomes infatuated with her, okay? So the fourth part is you examine the relation between the parts. So we've got all our parts, okay? We've analyzed it. We've looked at some sort of uh, elemental meanings, okay? The meanings of the parts. And now we examine the relation between the parts and the whole in the attempt to understand the whole meaning of the novel and the intention of the author. In other words, what's, what is Goethe trying to say in this text, right? And when I give my interpretation, 
okay, throughout the, at the end of this, um, you're going to see that this is my interpretation, right? So you could interpret it differently. And interpretations, now what you have to understand is that interpretations are not necessarily true and false, okay? They're not true and false because, well, there's a subjective element there in the sense that I'm saying, well, this is what I think Goethe means. And I can never really know absolutely for certain what Goethe me meant. Maybe even Goethe didn't actually know, so that sometimes interpreters can better understand novels than the person who wrote it, okay? Or like an artist, for example, makes a painting, sometimes someone else is better able to understand what the artist is saying. So that doesn't, so it means we don't have necessarily truth in the strict logical sense, okay? But we do have truth in a broader sense, in the sense that some interpretations can be better or worse, because you can have an interpretation of the novel and you can read that interpretation and say, you know, this interpretation doesn't make sense. You have all these contradictions in the novel, right, against your interpretation. So what you do in that case is you either kind of, you have to edit, kind of uh, rethink the interpretation or throw it out and find a new interpretation. So there's better interpretations and there's worse interpretations, okay, and you want to get to a, the better interpretation insofar as this is possible. And finally, you always have to examine your own prejudgments. Notice how I put the pre plus judici judices, the prejudices, right? So you always have prejudices when you approach things, and you have to be aware of those and try to understand what those are and see how those are influencing your interpretation. The more aware you are of your prejudgments, the better you'll be at interpreting because you can kind of catch yourself uh, before you start to judge or while you're judging even kind of suspend judgment on your judgments in order to see what's objectively to the, to the extent that you can discern it uh, semantically meaningfully within the text all right so that's analysis interpretation so let's start with a general analysis of Goethe's Werther again this is just very general so we have the main events take place between May 4th and December 20th 1771 uh, we see the book is divided into two parts. Uh, that, should, that should write, not book one, but book two, but part one, part two. Okay, and I've given titles to each. Uh, part one or book one is the infatuation stage, and part one or book part two or book two is the decline and tragedy. Now, notice how I have within each part or book a separation, and th that separation there into par further parts, subparts, would be based upon the dates of the letters uh, of Werther, which I haven't written here. So you're going to have to want to you're going to have to discover that for yourself. We see his retreat in the rural town where he goes to Valheim. We see where he falls in the scenes where he starts to fall in love with Charlotte. We see the scenes where Albert, her fiance, returns. Okay, and in the second part, we see where he leaves Valheim and he starts to work in the office. Um, of the uh, diplomat, and finally he leaves there after being humiliated. He returns to Valheim. There's an interlude where Goethe, Goethe himself apparently is talking, and then we have his final suicide. Okay, so this again is just an analysis. It's a very general analysis. When you read the text, what I want you to do is make sure you highlight those parts in the text where you think that you see these parts and do the best job you can. So, so for example, when you open up, you see maybe in the first part you can write infatuation stage. When you see that he's in Valheim in, in the first subpart, you can see, well, here's the retreat. And then you can see here's his love affair. Here's the return of Albert. In the second part, this is when he leaves Valheim and returns. See, so mark those out so you see the dates themselves. It will help you for studying, okay, and also for answering the reading questions. Now, the, I'm only going to give you the primary interpretive elements you need to interpret on your own. See, I don't want to give you too much. Uh, I'm going to give you a kind of direction to start looking, but of course I'm going to be asking you questions in terms of interpretation uh, with respect to Goethe's novel, and I want you to think on your own and try to figure out what Goethe's saying and what's happening and what you think is happening in the text on your own. Right. So here we have, now, interpretive elements. What I'm going to be talking about is how the, the, the characters and the different 
uh, scenes and the different aspects of the novel come out, the topics, for example, come out as symbols in the novel that are meaningful. Because each of the things that we look at within the novel have a certain meaning. Uh, one of them is Werther himself. And we see what is, what is he representing? What meaning is he representing? And here, for Goethe, Werther is seen as this kind of genuine or authentic human being. He's, he's the kind of authentic, romantic human being that we all should in some ways strive to be, although being that way, as we see, as we'll see in the end, can be dangerous because we allow, we follow our passions, we follow our creative spirit, we let fate kind of guide us, and we let our love guide us, but in the end, just as nature can be both peaceful and turbulent, we can be burnt and destroyed by our passions. Now, my interpretation here is that what Werther is doing is he's seeking the eternal within love, and he's seeking it in an individual mortal person, okay? And this is going to lead to his destruction, okay? Remember, that's my interpretation. Now, Valheim, the town that he goes to, for Werther, it represents his flight from the turmoil of his emotions, okay? So, in other words, he goes to this town to get away from his emotions, but, of course, we can never really escape our emotions. We have to deal with them, and so his emotions haunt him and return to him. And so you see, he tries to leave Valheim again, but he comes back, and his return eventually leads to his his destruction in a way. So now within the text, we're going to see these romantic scenes expressing nature. We're going to see scenes of lightning in the beginning uh, when he meets Charlotte and the storm in the beginning. In the end, we're going to see a flood. Okay, I want you to think about those scenes. Make sure you underline them as you read. And when you're done with the text, go back. Remember, make sure you underline and highlight all these interpretive elements as you find them as well as others, okay? So make sure you carefully read this text. Identify that, that scene of those scenes of nature that you see. Underline them I and think about what is, what is Goethe expressing, okay? Well, certainly he's expressing emotion, passion of the irrational, but also final destruction, flood, for example, before his suicide. What does that mean, right? Okay, the lightning and the storm as Charlotte and Goethe stand outside, okay? What's happening there as he falls in love with her? Okay? Charlotte herself, as I interpret it, represents the infinite and the eternal, that which good, which Werther seeks but can never have. So we, we seek the eternal and the infinite, and what happens if we can't have it? Okay, what happens when we seek meaning? We'll talk about this when we talk about Victor Frankl and man's search for meaning, but don't find meaning. You'll see in Victor Frankl's text that he highlights a very grim scene for those prisoners of war within Auschwitz in the concentration camps for those who are unable to find meaning. Make sure you read that text as well. It's a very powerful text, okay? And here Goethe's Werther will kind of highlight this in an earlier way in terms of Romanticism through the image and symbol of Charlotte, that meaning which Werther seeks but cannot have. Here we have Albert. Albert's going to be Charlotte's fiancé, and he's going to represent the noble society, the noble values and the morals of society, which of course romanticism is going to war against, and of course the French Revolution against those old aristocratic norms, those class distinctions where you had the noble and you had the servants and the serfs. Well, the, of course with the Enlightenment and the revolutions, we see that they begin to affirm the equality of the human being and the liberty of the human being, the power to think on our own. And Albert here He's always going to be called, her fiancé, a good man. He's a great man of virtue. And you see, in a way, in the text, he is a good guy, right? But at the same time, there's something about Albert which is kind of stiff or boring or kind of lacks life. That Albert, he just kind of lives according to the norms of society, those standards of society, which Werther will ultimately and deeply reject. And those norms and the kind of that aristocratic society will also reject Werther, make sure you recognize that scene where Werther gets humiliated by the aristocratic society, okay? And so Werther and Albert, as I say, are antagonistic spirits. In a way, Werther is subconsciously warring against Albert. You'll see this in the scene, for example, when they talk about 
uh, the gun that Werther borrows from Albert, and they talk about suicide. You'll see this antagonism between these two views. And finally, we have Werther's suicide itself, and this represents his response to his inability to obtain the infinite and eternal. We're going to see this again when we talk about Camus and the stranger. We're going to talk about this specifically, even when we talk about Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, we can talk about this too. So, and the way I talk about it here in this class is there are three types of responses. This comes out of Camus. The first is, well, in seeking the eternal, okay, well, what can we do? Well, we look into the universe and we see nothing there. We can hope. We can express faith and say, well, God exists. Love exists, right? And that's one possible response. Another response is to say, well, that love which I sought in that woman or that man, I cannot have. So therefore, there is no love. There's no meaning. And my life is meaningless and worthless. And this leads to resignation and even annihilation and suicide. And this is Werther's choice. And finally, we have a third choice, which Camus will talk about later on when we, we read The Stranger, which is affirmation and revolu revolution. And that response is to say, basically, that there is no meaning in existence. Therefore, I will create meaning on my own. I will create my own existence as meaningful. Okay? So all this we'll talk about later. So again, make sure you read through that novel. Be very careful. Try to, to think about that analytical part where you break it down and try to interpret that those parts because I will be asking you questions on that okay, later on. Um, so also make sure you, you watch that video on the French Revolution. It's a very important video, which okay, uh, which you'll have to, to to know for of course the test itself. So just just to keep in mind for the tests, you're not go, I'm not going to test you on specific facts, okay, and dates. I'll test you on basic ideas, okay, that you'll be getting from the videos and from the lessons themselves, right, in the books, right.